I mean, everybody would tell you that I am the last person they'd ever thought that had had nerve trouble. Right, spoiled. Anyone who you talk to. Lovely job, Because I talk to anyone. Now, if it was the winter, I'd be sh putting a shot of scotch in here. <laughs> Two spoonfuls. <laughs> One doctor said to me, it's like an air on your head. How fine an air is, is one side of it and the other side of it. That's how thin the margin is of being mentally ill or normal. This is the world's oldest psychiatric institution. It used to be known as Bedlam, a place we hid those we called mad. We need some medication. Now known as the South London and Maudsley. Andrew, I need to speak to you. It treats 50,000 patients a year. Any sign that you shit yourself? I, I don't think so. And numbers are rising. <laughs> the staff and patients open their doors to show us what Bedlam Ooh. is like today. You mention the Morsley, they go, that's the loony bin. I say, yeah, no, it's not. There's people there that's got an illness. It's an illness. But they won't have it. They think you're all mad. If you get to 65 without a serious mental illness, you probably think you're going to be OK. So did these people. Nine months ago, Lorraine was enjoying her retirement with her husband, Alan, after a 25-year career working as a nurse. But I don't remember me. I don't, I don't remember me. Vera was volunteering as a home help, but now she can't look after herself. How did all this happen? How did I land up in a psychiatric ward among all those people? I don't know. And last year, Peter was teaching English in Istanbul after a life spent traveling the world. I was an exhausted person and I knew it. I really... I hadn't got any get up and go, if you'd call it that. You know, get up and go. If my get up and go had got up and gone. None of them knew their lives were about to change and that they'd end up here on AL2, a psychiatric ward for older adults at the Morsley Hospital. Sylvia has bipolar disorder. She had a four month stay on the ward. Despite being discharged, she came back as a volunteer helper. They don't know what they're in here for, half of them. There's not one out there that thinks they're made. Well, they're not made. I don't like to think that I'm calling them made, but they'll just go to you, what am I doing here? And you've got to work that one out, what to tell them. I used to say, you're in here for a rest. Didn't know what else to say. People are afraid of old age, and of course they're afraid of mental illness. And they're afraid, they're afraid of them because they don't understand them, and, and which is why we pretend that they're a different species, because then we haven't got to encounter that prospect that it's going to be us one day. <laughs> Ours is a society that kind of values perfection, and as you get older, it becomes harder and harder to remain perfect. Morning, David. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm very well. A bit wild, but, you know, that's normal. Peter was the first patient we met. He seemed a bit eccentric until we were told he had a serious mental illness, schizoaffective disorder, yes, thank you. Oh, thank characterised by mood swings and delusions. 
I'm here because I took a few tablets and got picked up by an ambulance who decided I'd tried to take my life. I don't think it's true. Maybe it was leaving what I'd been doing for years. After all, I'd been teaching in Istanbul for 12 years, maybe to 15 years, I'm not quite sure. But it's a long time, and I did break from it, and it caused me some problems, which I wasn't handling very well when I came here. He took an overdose at the time he was describing how angels or some force in his right hand were forcing him to take it. So he was, he was felt to be a very high risk of suicide and it was an unknown quantity. We didn't know whether he had a, a depressive illness that he was perhaps masking, whether he had a, a, a schizophrenia where the voices were telling him to end his life. Um, and so he came here for an assessment. How many tablets did you take, Peter? Fifteen. That's nothing. <coughs> Wouldn't kill a cat, in my opinion. But a doctor would say, yeah, that's his opinion. But the intention. Why did you take them then? And to get help. <laughs> it was a way, wasn't it? Although he refuses medication, the doctors are satisfied Peter's now become much more stable and is ready to be discharged. Lorraine's been here five months and continues to baffle the staff. She was brought in by her family after becoming confused about who she is. She can't recall anything about her past. It happened suddenly, almost overnight. We're sort of trying to understand the behaviours, the things that she's saying about I'm not me, and I don't think she does recognise herself at the moment, and I think it's very painful. I don't think she does know who she is. My conversations with her, she said, actually, you should lock me up, you should take me away and lock me up somewhere, and I kind of said to her, actually, you are. You know, this, this, this is a psychiatric hospital, right? And, and then she said, you should kill me, just kill me. And then she said, actually, I want to take a knife and I want to cut my head open. I can't stand it anymore, I can't stand it. Hello, Lorraine. Lorraine was admitted with depression, but as times passed, the staff now believe she's suffering from an extreme case of dissociative disorder. It used to be known as hysteria and is rarely seen today. It's probably fair to say that Lorraine is one of the most challenging patients that we've had to deal with because it's quite difficult for everyone to get their heads around exactly what's wrong with her. But it was clear to us very quickly that this wasn't a straightforward case of severe depression. It's really hard, isn't it, not, not, not knowing who you are? It's really difficult. And you just don't recognise yourself anymore, do you? This isn't the person you remember. I don't remember me at all. I don't remember me. You don't even know who you should be. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. I don't know nothing. The diagnosis is one of what we call the dissociative state. The best way to kind of think about it is that we all struggle as we go through life. There are things that we have to do that we find difficult. But sometimes life can throw something at you that sends you into a fantastic spin, a terrible kind of conflict with yourself, and you can't deal with it. And so the way that you cope with it is by escaping to a sort of different state. What I thought really started me off was I lost my husband at 45. I lost my mum and my dad within 10 months, all the three of them. Never said goodbye to one of them. My mum was playing bingo at a hall. My dad went, was round the town all paying his rent. And my husband, he was indoors, but he was in the, in the bathroom. And he just heart attack and went over. And whether after a little while that got to me, because I felt as though death was following me round, because I had relations dying, friends, and you know, and it seemed terrible. 
seemed as though people was dying all round me and as though it was my fault. I don't know why I thought that, but that's what I did. No one quite knew how to treat Lorraine. Medication wasn't really working. But over the next six months, we were to witness something remarkable, something no one on the ward could have predicted. Peter, would you give Vera a compliment? With all, yes, I, with, I all, try to. with all the charm that you can muster. AL2 at the Maudsley is a psychiatric ward for over 65s in crisis. What, what charm can you find? Can you turn on? I think only the charm of honesty. I'm telling this truthfully. I've said it to you. You once think twice. that? I think that, yes. yes, you know it. When Vera was first admitted, she was frankly psychotic, very, very paranoid and agitated and suspicious. And the delusion that she had about myself and the nurses was that we, we weren't really doctors and nurses, we were actors pretending to be doctors and nurses, and that this wasn't really a hospital, that everything that was going on here was somehow a sham and a duplicate of a real hospital. And she had a conviction that something dreadful was going to happen to her. Can you give Peter a compliment back with all the charm you can muster? Yeah, I did say I'd join this group today and just sit and listen. And you, you're trapping me into... Am I trapping? Yes, you are. Yeah. Oh. Before she came here, Vera oh. had never suffered from a mental illness. These Medication has brought her psychotic delusions under control. Oh. But now she suffers with extreme anxiety. Oh. She hasn't been home for six months. Oh. Tonight she's spending a night alone in her flat to see how she copes. Oh, I can't do this. I don't want to do it. I don't want to stay here and I don't want to go there. What do I do? Where do I belong? I really want to have a cigarette. The nurses have booked Vera a taxi, but even that has set off her anxiety. It won't be there. It won't be there. You watch. It won't be there. It won't be there. See, it's not there. It's not there. That won't be our cab. Yeah, that's the cab there. Where's your point? Oh, no. Can you wait a minute, driver? Thank you. He says they can. And how do you feel about the prospect of spending your first night at home? Nervous. Oh. Very nervous. It's been about six, seven months since I was at home. Now I don't know if I can cope with it. I don't know. Oh, God. I've always been a fairly strong, confident person. But I'm not now, am I? I'm not now. So can it feel quite lonely in there, even though there's lots of people? Sort of. But it's even lonelier here because there isn't anybody. So what's the answer, Vera? I don't know. I don't know. 
When were you at your happiest? With my first husband. And with my second, but it wasn't quite the same. Was he your first love? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He was 57 when he died, and I was 35. I got married at 19. No children, you see. So... So there we are. I don't know if I can cope with staying tonight. I don't know whether to phone and go back to the ward or not. I don't know what to do. I can't just sit here all night, can I? After just an hour at home, Vera telephones the hospital asking if she can come back to the ward. Yeah, the thing is, I don't, I don't feel I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. She's phoning me at eight. First day I went home, didn't want to go home. There's letters all over the floor and, oh. And then in the finish, I didn't want to go back. I said, no, I'll stop. And I stopped. And then I stopped for a week. And I went back and they discharged me. And touch wood, I ain't been back since. Only to do uh, voluntary. But I can understand how some of them people feel in there. It is hard to come home. It's different now. Where you used to have right tight neighbours years ago, I mean, me and Josie next door, we still talk over the fence. But I, I couldn't tell you lives over there. Not like it used to be. But it's a different world now, isn't it? It is really. And I think sometimes it's a cruel world. Lorraine has been here several months, but the staff are still trying to work out what triggered her sudden breakdown. She's been with her husband, Alan, for 32 years, but doesn't recognise him. Lorraine's deterioration happened soon after she saw Alan nearly killed. I mean, Alan, Alan has had throat cancer and he's also uh, got a heart problem. Then he collapsed in the street and she was looking out her window and saw a car coming and Alan collapsing in the street. And she witnessed that. I got my wife back. I got to have back. I never leave her in heaven. But the worst thing was when she first came here for two weeks, they thought she was going to die. But she's come back and did me. First thing I hope she comes back. Lorraine? Lorraine has had a traumatic life. She was abandoned by her birth mother soon after she was born. What's not right, Lorraine? and in later life struggled with alcohol. For Lorraine, something about the loss, the potential loss of Alan, those kind of attachment issues are huge for her. So I think that's something we've got to work on. And again, you know, it, it is her sense of self. Who is she? We've come back to the keys. <laughs> I don't think it's been done before. <laughs> I don't know. Peter's preparing for a life away from the hospital. He's just viewed a flat in sheltered housing. Uh, you want a cup of I've got a cup of coffee. Please. Where have you been? I've been getting a house where you live. Where I live? I don't want you near me. Where are you going? Oh, where are you going? Tuesday, Monday. You're not? You're leaving here Monday? Yeah. I've got to get a bed, I've got to get carpet, I've got to make it right. You can't go in and lie, lie on the floor. 
Is it the latest wooden floor like this? No, it needs a carpet. It's going to cost you a few bob, isn't it? Mm. You're going to have to get a job. Yes, that's what I intend to do. Oh, you've got all your necessities, what yes. you need. It's Except a good, in a good woman. It's a good flat, a, a good woman. Yeah. I only react to love. Oh! You better watch out. And There's some is... hot women round that way. Really? Yeah. Oh. All right. Yes, fantastic. You feel excited? A little bit off normal. What do you mean, a little off normal? Um, uh, normal is behaving myself uh, in keeping with the ward, because I don't want to upset it, really. So do you think off the ward you can be a little more off normal? Yes. Peter didn't want to be medicated. He'd always refused drugs on the ward. But on his own, in the outside world, it was a choice that felt more risky. Do you know what? When you get better, shall we uh, have holiday in Las Vegas? Right. When you get better, shall we go to Las Vegas? Yeah. You've been there before? Where? Yeah. Las Vegas. No, I haven't. All gambling. Have you been home anymore, Vera? Once. Oh, okay. Yeah. She gave me three bad injections. That's why I got into my body. That's why you see I'm walking straight. Okay? <laughs> Don't get no better in here, does it? <laughs> Vera is struggling to cope with the idea of returning home on her own. Peter, on the other hand, was hoping he'd be free to live as he pleased when he left the ward. But he's still being monitored by a community mental health worker. Where is the safest place to cross? How do you mean? The safest place? Um, OK, you show me. Right. You show me where to go to cross. Well, actually, I dodge the cars because oh, I, do you? I got a habit. Oh. We've got a habit in Istanbul, uh, you know. We don't live so carefully. No, nah, I do, though. That's not safe. I want it you... depends what you classify as life. No, here, I suppose, the traffic okay. light. But there's a... So how do you cross? You wait for the light to change or you press well, the button? Well, I wait for the traffic to stop. Because this traffic... I think you press this button, Peter. Well, it... I, yeah, well, press it if you like, but I never do. You, you never do? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no, I didn't want to go this way. OK. Oh. We were going to cross, Peter. Well, well any way you like. Yeah. Maybe we shouldn't have You'll have to look for a crossing, Peter. I don't want you to cross the road. Peter. Hold up, Peter, hold up. Hold up? Hold up. The thing is... <laughs> the thing is... My responsibility is to help you to, but, but what I cross the road, how yeah, I please, yeah, but, okay? But yeah, but I, I, I have know. always done it, and I yeah. always will. But it's still not safe. I know I cross the road when yeah. I can. Not with I'm the not pedestrian an idiot. crossing, Peter. I'm not know, an idiot. I know you're not, but it's still not safe, and I still have to tell you. Well, you have told me, okay? I rather you use the pedestrian crossing next time. I, I'm being honest. Well, you're a bit... Yeah. Please don't go on. It's only crossing a bloody road. Yeah, but cars were moving, Peter, and they have oh, to stop. You're not moving. Yeah. Oh, for God's sake, Andrew. All right, don't get upset with me. I'm I just being honest. Yes, of course I am, because mm -hmm. I'm being mothered and smothered. I came out of Istanbul, which is a city, yeah. where they live. Fine. Peter struggled to accept his mental illness. He was a proud man. Maybe that's why he didn't want help whether through medication or from support workers. Am I discharged from that? Right? You're discharged from the hospital, one, but you're not discharged from our care, two. So you're still under the home treatment care, and that is our responsibility to come daily and make a report how you're coping in the community. Well, I'm coping very well in the community. OK, fair enough. But I'm obviously not coping with the home care thing. <laughs> <laughs> Going to press the buzzer, Peter? Press the button, yes. 
Thank you. Now that delighted you. Oh, you oh. make me feel good. <laughs> okay. You make me feel good. Well, it works, doesn't it? Yeah, look. see, look at that. All of a sudden, <laughs> Peter pressed the buzzer. Lorraine. Lorraine, I've got your morning tablets. Can you set up for me, please? Yeah? Thank you. Here's all sticking up. Right. Painkillers and your multivitamins and your metformin. Can you set up again for me? Lorraine. Well, Lorraine Akers is on an antidepressant, Sertraline. She's on Senna, paracetamol. She's on vitamin B, Fortisip, and metformin and thymine. Where I am. There are no signs that Lorraine is regaining her memory or any sense of her identity. Can you tell me a bit about your life? Okay, now, this is not my, this is my old, this is my old room. When I was looking out the door, when people were coming, what I was seeing was the new version or the afterlife place. Or, uh, that's where I would be going. People look to me to remain cheerful and positive and, and confident that we can get people better. If I lose confidence that I can get someone better, then the team isn't going to be confident either. Now sometimes what that means is that I have to maintain a kind of confident exterior and a confident kind of a facade, even though inside I'm thinking, this is the most difficult patient I've ever looked after. Don't put yourself in the floor. <laughs> Professor Howard has decided on a drastic step. Will you stand up for me? ECT stands for electroconvulsive therapy, which is a terrifying name for treatment. I have colleagues who will never use ECT for their patients and just don't believe it's a useful treatment. But that's very different from my experience. I mean, I, my experience is that ECT is a fantastic effective treatment for patients who have very severe depression. And the wonderful thing about ECT is that it gets patients better very, very quickly. They inject you with something that's freezing cold goes through your vein, freezing cold through your vein, and they put things on your head, and then you're out by then, and you don't know nothing. Peter had been out of hospital just a week, when we began to notice his thinking was becoming more disordered. Home is where the heart is. Where is that? The heart. Uh, home, I should say, it's where we fell from. I've got to say that. And when I say I've got to, I'm telling the truth. Home is, is there, we fell. We're, this is not our home. We've adopted the Earth and we've, we've destroyed the surface of the Earth completely. It's not natural anymore, it's all buildings. And we've done that right across the face of the Earth and now we want to do it to Mars. We haven't done what we're supposed to do, find out what we are, where we are, who we are and why we are. We haven't found out any of that. Me, I'm a human being, but I'm more than that. I'm someone else as well.
Peter's psychotic delusions were also re-emerging. This hand talks to me quite a lot. I ask always. A follow guide, yes, of course he does. He's the son. When did you last ask your hand something? My hand just now. I don't remember what I asked before. Probably asked, are we all right? And the hand said, yes. You're more than all right, thank you. And the left foot talks to me, but I've not had a lot of communication with Hermes, who I've been arguing on his behalf. And I don't need to, because they do their own arguing, but the world has been neglected. I've said you've neglected this world, and they have. It's true, isn't it? Yes, it is. Who's going to listen to my right hand? And that's the daughter of the queen of, of the king of heaven is there. Whether you believe it or not, it's the truth. It was the truth down in Egypt at the time of Ramesses II, and it's the truth now. So, shall we start by seeing Lorraine, talking about Lorraine? Because she's having recent tea and everything else, but good to just get that. So, I mean, I've heard all sorts of stories. She was uh, very restless and agitated after her ECT, and it did take three of us to assist her with her personal care because she was so agitated and aggressive. And after she was changed and she sat down on the couch, she was just fine. And then I went over to her about an hour later, and um, I was just chatting away to her, and I was like, do you remember my name? And she was like, yeah, it's Emma. And there was just a few other staff around the lounge, and I was like, do you know their names? And she was like, yeah. And then I was just like, what about your doctor? Is your, your consultant? And she was just like, she had to think for about 30 seconds, and then she was like, Howard, Howard. So I've never had a conversation, a proper conversation with Lorraine. So I guess it would be quite interesting to do that and see what she thinks, wouldn't it, about, yeah. about these things. Hello, Hello Lorraine. Hi. I feel like I'm introducing myself for the first time. I'm Professor oh. Howard. Hi. Good, well, good to, nice good, to meet you. Good to meet you. Good to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Come and have a seat next to me. So, Thank you very much. there's an enormous crowd of people here. Yes, wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. And uh, many of them have been involved in your care. Well, there's nine months. I have no recollection whatsoever. Right. Gosh. None Nothing. at all. None at all. No. Amazing. And a bit frightening, I should think, too, isn't it? Well, it uh, was hard to believe a couple of days ago when I was told I'd been here for nine months. Yeah. But and I don't even remember talking to you. Right. Well, you've never had a proper conversation. No. You've, you've, you've come into this room and sometimes lay down on the floor at my feet while I've talked Have to I? you. Have yeah, I? A couple of times, yeah. Well, I um, hope I didn't lay on them. No. Okay. No, no, no. You were, you were, you were, you were very careful <laughs> where, where you lay. Good. Great to see you like this. Thank you. So Wonderful. Much. Well done. Nice talking to you. <laughs> nice meeting everybody. I don't remember your names, but anyway. The transformation was remarkable. After two sessions of ECT, yes. Lorraine was barely recognizable from the woman we'd first met. How amazing. And, um, and how weird, too, to talk to her like that. Yeah. Because like she was, I came left on Friday evening, and then when I came back in yesterday morning, and Jennifer had been here all weekend, and she was just like, "Oh my God, wait, you see her?" And yesterday morning, I was like, just totally stunned how she was. And isn't it fascinating that it was ECT that finally? <laughs> it worked because it's such a powerful intervention yeah. that she was able to believe that that's what made her better. Yeah, yeah. And, and get, yeah, it was. It was just like yeah. so. We saw. With, 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 with the sort of stimulant drugs and with the antipsychotics, we saw little, little but not sustained improvements, yeah. didn't we? Yeah. So this is just a bigger version of, the, of that thing. The ECT had worked like a placebo. By radically changing Lorraine's treatment, it appeared to have given her the belief she needed to get better. She calls it waking up when I first woke up. What she was really keen to say was, you know what, 
I was a nurse, I did this, I did that, you know, this is who I am, I am this person. And, and it was like she was, you know, needed to tell people exactly who she was and that was very, very important because for nine months she'd, she'd, she'd lain there and said, I don't know me, I don't know me, I don't know who I am. Out in the community, Peter's yes. mental health was deteriorating. He'd been called in to see psychiatrist Dr Rao. Right, where would you like to sit? Anywhere you like. OK, would you like to sit over? OK. Over here. Yes, yeah. of course. One of my jobs is to make an independent and objective opinion about your mental state. OK. OK? Mm. Never having met you before and having read the previous notes. What is it, what, what problems do you feel that you have at the moment? None. <laughs> no problems at yeah. all. No, mm. no, I haven't. OK. How are you sleeping at the moment? Very well. You're sleeping well, without yeah. any medication whatsoever? No medication. OK. And what about your energy? What's your energy like? It's all, it's all right. When do you have your first drink in the morning? I don't have a drink in the morning. OK, so what... what I drink you, coffee. So during the day, when do you have your first alcoholic drink? I don't have an alcoholic drink. So you don't drink at all now? Well, I, not unless I'm meeting a friend or I go out and I have one. Have you had any problems with, with drinking in the past? Probably drinking drank much, much more, yes. How much would you have been drinking in the past? Paul, 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 I drank a lot in Istanbul. Well, what are we talking about? Well, I drank 15 litres one night. We were trying to emulate Alexander the Great one, two of us. Uh -huh. And we discovered that he went to Athens and drank 15 litres of wine. Right. And he drank another 15 right. litres of wine and he died. But you had 15 litres that day? Uh, we did drink 15 litres, but we mixed it, beer and right, wine. Right, right, OK. And I had an accident, broke my shoulder, mm -hmm. falling off a stairway. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's a long time ago now. Yeah. But if I said to you, Mr Rawlins, mm. that, that, if I said to you that at the moment, oh, yes. m our feeling and my feeling and, and, and the, the, the home treatment team's feeling is that you're probably in unusually good spirits. And as you get older, mental, illness can, mental illnesses can be more subtle. They don't always present in a characteristic way. No, right. And my, my, my observation, Mr Rawlins, is, is that you, you have got uh, what we'd call hypomania. Now, you may not agree with that. You're slightly on the upside of what we would conventionally call normal. Overactive. Yeah, it's slightly more than that. It's actually a type of, a type of illness that's Bit causing you to, to, to be like this. Oh, well, I mean, I'd you better may... go back to Istanbul, hadn't I? Do, do you think there's any, any scope for, for, for trying some medication that might help regulate the... No, I don't mood? want to change no. myself. I have no intentions of changing myself. Bit of a tricky one when the psychiatrist is saying to you that you might need treatment and you don't feel that you need it. It's always a dilemma with it's mental health, isn't I've it? I've been discharged from the hospital, Doctor. I know, I know. It's your choice whether you take medication or not. That's right. Psychiatry hasn't changed, but when the man said, you will not do this, I left England. There's several Peters, if you like, out there, maybe hundreds of Peters out there, who are not a danger to anyone, they're functioning well, they may be slightly, regarded as slightly eccentric, but they're mentally unwell. It's only after the second, third, fourth episode of coming in with a simple presentation and going out like a revolving door, it then brings home to the patient the fact that there is something wrong. I always thought people being in a hospital two weeks was long enough. We're seeing the real, the true Lorraine. I don't know. Because we're used to seeing you lying on a couch all day and not talking. And me, I'm You never type. used to speak to us. Never. No? No. Mm. You used to mumble and be like, I'm not who you think I am. Mm. Don't you talk. Yeah, and you used to say that I don't have a husband and I don't have a family. Oh. And I don't have a daughter. Hmm. Mm. No, Can you imagine yourself lying down on a couch for nine months and not speaking? No. <laughs> not me. The side we know of you is the Lorraine not talking, not communicating, not even opening her eyes, just wanting to lie down, having to sit you up for your meals. I'm shocked. I know. 
the danger is that Lorraine just wants to pick up and be busy again and, and get her sense of self that way rather than kind of peeling back some of the layers, which, which will be painful actually, uh, and thinking about who she is really. say something was wrong with me. You know, I always were worrying about everybody else and I didn't like to bother anybody. So I probably kept it in too much and didn't realize what it was doing to me. Did you think this day would ever come, you being discharged from the ward? I can't believe I'm on the ward. That, you know, I've just always been me. So this type of environment it would only be work-wise for me, looking after people. So for me to be here and not knowing how I got here or anything, yeah, it's quite overwhelming. Well, I want to get a double cheeseburger from McDonald's. <laughs> Although Lorraine's finally leaving the ward behind, she'll return for regular psychotherapy sessions and counselling. Lorraine didn't disappear into that dissociative state for no reason at all. I mean, she disappeared into it because she was unable to cope with the pressures and strains of her life. Now, those pressures and strains, you know, may return and may still be there, but by coming back into life, she's exposing herself to the anxieties and the difficulties that, that, that drove her into that dreadful state. Oh. Peter's meeting with psychiatrist Dr. Rao has made him even more determined not to take medication. What's your opinion? Oh, you think he was rude? Mm. He was talking to a patient. Yes, he was. That's silly doing that. I can talk to him anyway. But I like doing that. I love my system. I'm not going to have it uh, tranquilised by an idiot. He wants to put me in hospital and put me on treatment. I know what he wants exactly. He's got to be able to take me somewhere and prove that I need medication. What's he going to give it to me for? Being active? Isn't that my lucky day that I'm 86 and active? He didn't expect me to say no. He thought I would acquiesce and say, OK, what treatment if I'm a bit active, yeah. I don't want slowing down. That's the last thing. Is he mad? has been on the ward for almost a year, but has gradually started to regain the confidence she once had and is going home. Oh. Have you missed the ward, Vera? No. But to me, that was a bad period in my life. I want to forget it. I'll miss the, the kind staff, but I won't miss being on the ward, because that means I'm a patient. I hope that's the last locked door I see. This is home. This is home. Vera was home, well, and this time, she was happy to be there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank pleasure. you. I just hope that um, it, it'll be all right, and that I'll just grow old a little bit gracefully, I hope. I'm old enough as it is, I'm 82, but um, I don't know what, how many years ahead I've got or not. I'm just hoping that uh, it'll be all right. In a society, old people and people with mental health problems come right at the bottom of the heap, really. 
So if you're old and you've got mental health problems, you've got the sort of dreadful double whammy of, of, of disadvantage. And those of us who work in this area, we kind of feel, well, if older patients who've got mental health problems are being well looked after, then at least that's a, right down at the bottom of society's kind of um, interests and, and, and levels of importance. That somehow you can hope the rest of society will look after itself, so long as the people down here are being well cared for. The time we'd spent on the ward made you think about your own parents, your own life, and how fragile everything was, how easily things could change. Oh, we've got another new woman. Bloody hell. See what I mean? It must be the weather. I never really say, um, well, I am all right, but you get scared when you say that because you know how easy it is to go the other way. That's what I am, bipolar. I just remembered it. See, I do remember these things, but I don't know what it means. I ain't got a clue. I think it means that I'm double nutty. Since leaving the ward, Lorraine has been readmitted twice. She continues to present a challenge to the doctors. And at 86, Peter is still managing his mental health the way he wants to. Hello, Peter. Hello, Lorraine. Hello, Peter. Hello, Lorraine. Hello, Peter. Hello, Lorraine. Hello, Peter. Hello, Lorraine. Hello, Peter. H